Mediumship of the tape recorder. Dr. Constantin Rodi, once a student of Carl Jung and a former professor of psychology at the universities of Uppsala and Riga, believed that a tape recorder left running in record mode in a quiet room can capture the voices of the dead. This phenomenon, if it exists, was prophesied by Thomas Edison, inventor of the phonograph but discovered by a musician and film producer named Friedrich Jürgensen at the end of the 1950s. Taking a tape recorder out to the Swedish countryside to record birdsong, he also picked up faint conversations, which, coincidentally or not, were discussions of nocturnal bird vocalizations. Jürgensen published a book, Voices from the Universe, which alerted parapsychologists. In 1971, Ply Records, the same company that released many important pop and R&B records in the 1960s, participated in experiments aimed at testing the theory. During an 18-minute recording, the engineer heard nothing over his headphones, although the VU meter indicated constant signals. The playback, those present heard over 200 voices. These psychophonic voices sound like swarms of oral garbage, the ether talk of subliminal toadfish captured in the global babble of dead city radio transmissions that fills our so-called silence. Perhaps they are spirits trying to tell us something. But what? Curating the world. At the dawn of audio recording, a small boy named Ludwig Koch sat under a piano with an Edison phonograph, recording the playing of Johann Brahms onto a wax cylinder. This document, made on the cusp of a new era of music and technology, was lost when Koch fled from Nazi Germany, but at the age of eight, he also made the first known recording of an animal, an Indian Sharma thrush, in 1889. Zoos, museums, expositions, cameras and microphones, collectors, memorizers and curators of the world. Collecting, at least in the West, where time is thought to be linear and irreversible, implies a rescue of phenomena from inevitable historical decay or loss writes James Clifford, professor in the History of Consciousness program, University of California. Since the mid-19th century, he continues, ideas of culture have gathered up those elements that seem to give continuity and depth to collective existence, seeing it whole rather than disputed, torn, intertextual or syncretic. Margaret Mead's almost postmodern image of a local native reading the index to the Golden Bough just to see if they had missed anything is not a vision of authenticity. 
Clifford applies the term chronotope, as used by Russian critic Mikhail Bakhtin, to New York City during World War II, a place where surrealist artists and anthropologists bathed in a wonderland of sudden opening to, to other times and places, of cultural matter out of place. He defines chronotope as literally time-space, with no priority to either dimension. The chronotope is a fictional setting where historically specific relations of power become visible and certain stories can take place. The bourgeois salon in 19th century social novels, the merchant ship in Conrad's tales of adventure and empire. As technology has changed, so the recording studio has become increasingly virtual. What began as documentation moved into specialized interiors. Sounds of the world were collected and transmuted at the end of the 1940s by a French sound engineer, Pierre Schaeffer, who gave concerts of noises collected from sources such as spinning saucepan lids and whistling toy tops, steam engine boat sounds, the futurist noise of movement, human voices and percussion. Working with composers Pierre Henri and later Luc Ferrari, Schaefer pioneered musique concrète, music made from sound. Varese completed the electronic section of Désert in Schaefer's Paris studio. By 1951, electronic music experiments were taking place in Germany and America, eliminating the musical performer almost entirely. By the mid-1950s, pop music producers were applying echo effects with such abandon that the secure physical image of a band of musicians held in the mind during listening began to disintegrate. Then multi-track tape and mu multiple microphone recording separated musicians from each other, either in time or space. Electronic effects could be applied more easily to individual instruments or vocals. Musicians were hidden behind baffle boards or shut in separate rooms. Studio performances could be corrected or updated without changing the entire song, or the song could be remixed endlessly. For the best explication of multi-track recording, the upside and downside, watch Jean-Luc Godard's film, One Plus One, in which the Rolling Stones wrestle for eternity with the emergence of one song, Sympathy for the Devil. Fascinating to think about or describe, but boring to watch and listen. With the introduction of computer sequencing and digital sampling, the tape in the studio became a possibility, though rarely a total reality. Hard disk recording in which all source sound and effects, electronic or acoustic, could be stored and manipulated in the digital domain is the current stage of this process, a point at which, in theory, the studio and its musical output can exist in virtuality, represented in our world through sound and a visual representation of sound on a computer screen. The virtual studio, then, is our chronotype, the fictional setting where stories take place. What a disappointing chronotype, though, by comparison with Conrad's merchant ships. No saline odors, creaking timbers, or screeching steam whistles, but a facsimile of a bloodless operating theatre, the chemist's laboratory lacking in smells or fire. Brand new bag. Despotic control and technological deceit are regarded commonly as corrupting forces which destroy the authenticity and communality of music. I remember fondly a cartoon printed in a magazine to which I subscribed as a young guitarist. A drawing depicting Elvis Presley seen from behind as he sang and pretended to play an electric guitar in which a radio was concealed. In February 1965, James Brown and his band interrupted their lengthy bus journey 
for a show by stopping off at a studio in North Carolina for barely an hour to record Papa's Got a Brand New Bag. The song dragged for nearly seven minutes as the musicians, including guitarist Jimmy Nolan, struggled with fatigue. The track was meant to be hit, dance craze R&B on the cusp, reaching back through history to the swinging jazz inflections of Wynonie Harris, Little Willie John and Louis Jordan, looking back even further to rent parties and fish fries, but at the same time groping towards the disco cyborg of the future. Whatever was latent in those weary grooves, somebody heard it, for as Cliff White and Harry Weinberg wrote in their notes, for the James Brown Star Time CD box of 1991. In a brilliant post-production decision, the intro was spliced off and the entire performance was sped up for release. A huge pop hit was razor bladed out of something that started as a flat foot grind, this taut amalgam of street slang, loping beats and nervous punchy accents arguably the first moment of modern soul. Brown's quoted reaction reflected his glimpse into a future, our present, in which songs are titles, source points, initializations, indicating the beginning and the reference point for a process of continual transformation. It's a little beyond me now, he confessed. I'm actually fighting the future. It's, it's, it's just out there. A peculiar aspect of the story is that most of us have only become aware of the unpromising origins of this fabulous, pivotal track more than a quarter of a century after the event. Were it not for the obsession by a CD release for the alternate take, and hence the release of Papa's Got a Brand New Bag, in its complete and previously unreleased, unedited, slow form, we would be none the wiser. Once amused in a patronizing sort of way to learn that one of the guitarists from the ventures learned to play by struggling to copy Les Paul's artificially accelerated and overdubbed bionic guitar solos, I now realize that I can be fooled just as easily. But what a privilege to be so easily deceived into pleasure, revelation, motivation. The beauty of exploitation overdubs or dead zone duets is their realization of the potential of studio music as science fiction. The configurations which our imaginations whisper, but our bodies so rarely conceive. A great advantage of working with dead people is that their objections, the objections of habit, fixed identity go unheard. In 1988, James Brown sang in that scorched earth scream of his, I'm real, that editing equipment and tape speed controls had already, decades ago in fact, thrown that desperate, insecure claim into doubt. Dream. Sitting in a Las Vegas entertainment lounge. Despite being in Vegas, the room looked more like a Barnsley working men's club, spacious with a hint of plush but terminally bleak. Chairs lined up in long rows, bare walls, exposed stage. The quartet that took the stage was fronted by Elvis Presley, the only other identifiable member being ambient DJ Mixmaster Morris. <laughs> Morris was wearing his silver holographic suit, as usual, while Elvis looked fit, tanned, and surprisingly boyish. I was amazed by his youth and the quality of his voice. The music sounded like Heartbreak Hotel era Presley, crooned over drifting, electronic ambient sound. After a while, I became suspicious. Was this really Elvis? Then I noticed that his loafers were scuffed. Elvis was a fake, content in a void. A number of interpretations of this dream are possible. Presley's reluctance to vacate the planet has become a bit of a bore, 
but his posthumous presence in supermarket queues reminds us how little we knew him when he was alive. The perpetual reconstruction of celebrities through revisionist biographies and tabloid surrealism has an odd effect. Post-war pop culture is so entwined in myth and yet so young that one major facelift or smear job can tilt the entire picture. As a baby boomer, old enough to have been aware of mid-1950s rock and roll as it happened, I was misled and self-deceived into believing that the lifestyles of the rich and famous could be deduced from their music and outward image. Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard were wild and crazy guys, clearly pursuing lives without shape or restraint. And this ebb and flow, inspired by angels and demons alike, was counterbalanced by a grid of placid order and white picket fences beamed out into the universe by Andy Williams, Perry Como, Doris Day. Naive, of course, or what could be closer to the edge of 20th century alienation, or more ambient in their way than the weird, hermetic, formless existences fashioned in late life by big shots of entertainment central USA, such as Howard Hughes and Dean Martin, and then imagined into print by, respectively, Michael Drosnin and Nick Toshis. Remote control broke Drosnin and Citizen Hughes. There was no need to venture out, not even to stand up. Jean Martin, Dean Martin's second wife, conjures a similar image of free fall. Quoted as saying, Tosh's Dino, he was always content in a void. So did my dream resolve certain supposedly oppositional tendencies in popular music? Dionysian Apollonian, radical conservative, underground populace, plugged, unplugged, only to leave me stranded with the comforting spectrum of fakery and illusion. Perhaps my unconscious was transmitting cryptic prophecy. Was this how music would be in the year 2000? Future music is imagined in terms of technological hybridization, all winking lights and digital exchanges across alien cultures. Perhaps I was dreaming up some kind of impossible virtual quartet manufactured through interactive holography, the equivalent of dream football teams. Rocky Marciano versus Mike Tyson, imaginary all-time supergroups. Charlie Parker recording with Edgar Barreras and so on, or the lost tracks of Prince with Miles Davis, Miles with Jimi Hendrix, and other vaunted but vaulted collaborations what boys would contrive themselves if they only had the technology. Techno, at the end of the 20th century, may come to mean inept folk singers, lonely bigots, somnambulant fishermen, and Christian monologists on public access cable television, the global coffee house of MTV's spoken word unplugged, poetry for the ambient TV generation internet conferences on dog training or CD storytelling. Imagine the most likely use for the wide city, city of the future, not in cyberpunk or megatripolizing world music frameworks then, but as a high-tech campfire, people plugging in to remind themselves of life as it was when they were plugged out, twisting their isolation into something resembling community. Floating, amorphous, oceanic crooning, or crooning with attitude, seems to mirror the feeling of non-specific dread that many people now feel when they think about life, the world, the future. Yet it expresses a feeling of bliss. But bliss is non-specific also, covering a spectrum which ranges from stress management at one end to spiritual ecstasy at the other. So disquiet, hovers in balance with the act of escapism or liberation. Silence. When death's chauffeur turns on the car radio in Jean Cocteau's film Orfe, a voice from the underworld recites disconnected lines of enigmatic poetry and strings of numbers. 
the first line we hear in the film is, silence is twice as fast backwards, three times. John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds, was premiered in 1952. The piece required a musician to present a timed performance at an instrument without making a sound. David Tudor gave his, last, gave his first performance on piano. I said last because he died. <coughs> Using a stopwatch to time three sections, marking the beginning and end of the piece by lowering and finally raising the piano lid without ever touching the keys. For this reason, the work is often assumed to have been composed for piano, whereas Cage instructed in his score that any, any instrument could be not play. The piano is one of the easiest options, since the exaggerated theatre of sitting and preparing to play, practised by most concert pianists and parodied to perfection by comedian Max Wall, provides a clear way of showing that something is being performed. 4 minutes 33 seconds is often referred to colloquially as silence on the mistaken assumption that this was a Zen demonstration of nothingness. But Cage had discovered the non-existence of silence in Harvard University's anechoic chamber, a soundproof room without any reflective surfaces, where he sat and heard the high singing note of his nervous system and the deep pulsing of his blood. Nothing happens in 4 minutes 33 seconds, except for a growing awareness of the immediate sound environment. I have a recorded version performed by pianist Gianni Emilio Simonetti and released by the Italian Kraus label in 1974. The idea seems ridiculous, yet for the first time I listen to the surface noise of a bad vinyl pressing from Italy with interest rather than irritation. In his sleep notes to Cage's Variations 4, Joseph Berg referred to Morse Peckham's book man's rage for chaos. In particular, his definition of art that is consistent with the rest of contemporary life has been any perceptual field which an individual uses as an occasion for performing the role of art perceiver. Four minutes, 33 seconds, directed listeners towards the situation and, in its literally quiet influence, this work in which there is no tangible work, has done so ever since. Nineteen sixty-eight, a psychedelic club called Middle Earth, Covent Garden, London, an event called Float. Yoko Ono is performing, along with a number of other London-based happening artists. The only memorable performance, however, comes from artist John Latham. He is hunched over a large, floor-standing electric saw, the kind you see used by timber merchants. This is connected by contract microphones to an amplifier, and he is passing books through the saw blade, slicing them into chunks. A monstrous, chaotic, exhilarating drone batters the air. 1994, Disobey Club, Islington, London. For 40 minutes, Richard James, the Aphex twin, plays two highly amplified records made of sand and discs. The sound is augmented by the noise of an amplified food mixer. Sometimes the noise is so loud that it blocks out all conversation in the room. 1960, a loft on Chambers Street, New York City. Yoko Ono, the occupant of the loft, is approached by electronic composer Richard Maxfield with a view to collaborating on a series of new music concerts curated with the Mont Young. For the first, John Cage and David Tudor turn up. The following year, Yoko performs at Carnegie Hall. Maxfield provides electronics and technical assistance. Performers with contact microphones take to their bodies falling heavy objects across the pitch black stage, wrote Robert Palm for his booklet essay, accompanying the CD, Ono Box. 
If Richard Maxfield had not committed suicide in 1969, and his electronic music pieces were not so difficult to find or to hear, then our ideas of how music has changed and opened out during the past 35 years might be very different. His influence permeates the psychedelia of Joseph Byrd's rock band, The United States of America, released on CBS in 1968. He worked with Yoko Ono, and although most rock critics attribute the Stockhausen influence to the Lennon Ono tape experiments of the Beatles' White Album, and after, they are far closer to the work of Maxfield. In 1960, Lamont Young presented Maxfield's work to a group of Bay Area composers, which included Terry Ryan. Riley's Maxfield's 1960 piece called Amazing Grace sampled and treated the voice of a revival preacher named James G. Brody. Steve Wright's far better known piece, Take Loop Pieces, It's Gonna Rain and Come Out, both of which sampled black voices, were composed in 1965 and 1966, respectively. In 1960, Joseph Byrd and Lamont Young enrolled in Maxfield's electronic music classes at the New School in New York. At the heart of avant rock, hybrid electronics and plunder phonics, yet completely obscured by the vagaries of history, is Richard Maxfield. Steam. Maxfield's Steam 4, 1961, was created by tape processing and manipulations of steam recorded from radiators in Maxfield's New York apartment. 1994, Mick Harris, ex-drummer with Napalm Death, now recording unsettled, unmoored electronic pieces under the names of Lull and Scorn, sends me a letter describing his working methods. My sounds are source sounds from fridges to radiators. I'm a big fan of a razor head, etc., etc. That type of radiator, drone, drift sound. Night music, created from the interaction of an oscilloscope and a tape recorder. I noticed that the electronically generated sounds I had produced were at Maxfield, were identical in feeling to those made by birds and insects on summer nights in Riverside and Central Parks in New York City. After this discovery, I then assembled a small portion of the material which I had made into a multi-channel composition intended to evoke this antiphonal chirping of birds and insects on a summer night. 1994, Michael Prime, ecologist and performer of live electronics, sends me his CD, Aquifers, and a manifesto. In my music, he writes, I try to bring together sounds from a variety of environmental sources into a performance space particularly sounds which ordinarily would not be audible. Traffic sound may be filtered so that it resembles the sounds of surf, while actual sea sounds may be transformed to conjure up images of an interstellar dust storm. I am especially interested in organic sound sources such as plants, fungi, and the human nervous system. Shortwave signals interpenetrate our bodies at all times and provide a vast musical resource. Many of the characteristic effects of electronic music, such as ring modulation, filtering, phase shifting, and electronic drone textures, were first heard in the interaction of early radio broadcasts with the Earth's magnetic layer. Perhaps Gaia was the first composer of electronic music. At a given location, plants, fungi, animals, and humans could be used to drive sound sculptures, and receivers could be tuned to radio, gamma, and cosmic rays, live musical interactions, and a new ecology of sound. Bacchanal, Richard Maxfield's most remarkable piece, created in 1963. A surreal mix of spoken poetry, read by Edward Field, who also plays the clarinet, drum, and typewriter live violin scraping noise, Korean Kriagon Sanjo, Spanish flamenco, treated violin sounds, 
treated saxophone played by Terry James, underwater clarinet sounds, live jazz recorded at the fire spot. This eight minute montage appears to begin in an overlapping series of rooms and fall through space into a subterranean slow motion zone. Quietly, never, never left. I am listening to summer fleas jump off my small female cap onto the polished wood floor of the wall. Outside, starlings are squabbling in the fig tree, and from behind me I can hear swifts wheeling over rooftops. An ambulance sign, full panic mode, passes from behind the left center of my head to starboard front. Next door, the neighbors are screaming, fuck you, I didn't, get out that door, but I tune that out. The ambient hum of night air, a low-frequency motor vehicle drone merges with insect hum, called back from the 1970s. A country garden somewhere, high summer in the afternoon. The snow has settled, I can smell wood smoke. Looking for fires, I open the front door, peer out into the shiny dark and hear stillness. Not country stillness, urban shutdown. So tranquil. Truthfully, I'm lying in intensive care, wired, plugged, and electronically connected. I have glided from coma into a sonic simulation of past and past life. As befits an altered state, the memories have been superimposed, stripped of context, conflated from seasons, times, eras, moments, even fictions, into a concentrated essence of my existence in the sound world. These sounds reconnect me to a world from which I have disengaged. Sound places us in the real universe. And then the comfort note of air conditioning. <coughs> the slow glide of electronic curtains. My exit probably. But I still hear the sound of fleas jumping off my small female cap onto the polished wood floor. about electronic or experimental music you won't even find them in the index. Right. Um, his estate is now administered by Lamont Young, as I understand it, who, um, in typical Lamont Young fashion, chooses not to release anything to the public, but instead occasionally allow private hearings of some of his music, which... Um, I think it's um, rather sad because I think if his music was reissued now 
um, anybody interested in current developments of any kind of electronic music or sampling or the history of sampling, sound sampling, or in fact the developments of experimental music in this century which find them fascinating and extremely revealing. And um, something I've learned since I wrote the book, um, which has added to my knowledge, I, I've recently written some sleep notes for some previously unissued Terry Riley material. And I've been sent other Terry Riley material from the 1960s before he was recording for Columbia, um, recording famous pieces like In Sea and Rainbow Curve Dead. And um, he was making pieces that were influenced strongly by Maxfield, including tape manipulations of Tamil Motown records, which were made specifically for clubs at the time, which probably sounds a little bit familiar in the mid-90s. Um, so that adds another dimension to um, Maxfield's unwritten role as a, as a prophet in both electronic music and sound sampling. And it's, it's pretty extraordinary. I mean, I think it's a combination of circumstances that he died before he became well known and his work was not well distributed. Um, and then it happens to be administered by a man who is obsessively well, Tony Conrad described him among them as anal retentive, so <laughs> he knows him better than I do. But, um, I hope you know more information will be available on him at some point in the near future. Anybody else? or a beer or something like that. No, but it, it actually ends. It ends just before I finished it, which was. Um, uh, <laughs> 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 which was a couple of years ago. So it's uh, it's it's kind of as up to date as it could be. Oh, right. I mean, it, it, the, the thing I didn't really go into in any detail, which in a way was extremely appropriate was the developments at that time in jungle and drum and bass. And that is only kind of mentioned. But um, yeah, it, it, it thank you. Thank you me both. Yeah. I'll take the beer. <laughs> um, that particular date, I, I think you may have remembered it because it was a significant date for two reasons. Um, actually three reasons, although I didn't realize it until recently. Um, one reason was that in 1889, Debussy heard Javanese music in Paris. And for me, in, in some respects, that's a symbolic beginning of 20th century music. You know, the virtual traveler who hears alien music without actually traveling to hear it and is strongly influenced by it. And then in 1989, Jimmy Corsi and Alex Patterson were playing a strange mixture of um, records ranging from dub reggae to Brian Eno to birdsong records to um, <coughs> Strauss waltzes at uh, a London club, which was, was really 
the beginning of uh, the chill out room and uh, ambient music as we've come to know it. The third, the third reason, which I didn't didn't really um, think about until recently, was that 1889 was also the date when Ludwig Koch recorded the uh, Indian Sharma Thrush, which was the first wildlife sound recording ever made, to anybody's knowledge. So also, as well as Debussy hearing um, Debussy having his music musical environment expanded dramatically. There was also this technological um, expansion of, into environmental sound. So it's that hundred years is, is a neat device. You know, it's a kind of linkage of this bringing of the environment into music, breaking open music by allowing the environment into it rather than creating music which is specifically designed to exclude the environment. Uh, how, how big an influence did you see someone like uh, Lee Perry um, and the people who were around him like in the late 70s who basically made him like the physically like, like, like cutting the chord things? I, I think it's a, yeah, it's a huge influence. Um, there's there's a, uh, an interview with Lee Perry in the book and the section about King Tubby. And, uh, I think the way in which they manipulated sound, they took pre-existing recordings and manipulated them into sound fields, soundscapes, using very limited equipment, has had a huge influence, not only on popular music since then. I mean, disco is an obvious example, and all kinds of electronic music which was followed on from reggae and disco and um, synthesizer pop of the 70s and 80s. But um, I think a lot of experimental music, well, I say experimental, I don't know what experimental music is anymore because it just seems a continuum to me. But I think all kinds of music have benefited from the influence of those innovators in Jamaica who were using incredibly limited equipment compared to what even the most basic home studio has now. But the results I still find very inspiring. I heard um, this new release of uh, Scientist it's just, just put out in England by Blood and Fire, his very first recordings, and it, it still sounds so fresh, so so full of life and innovation. What is that for you? Mm. <laughs> but um, CD on your desk, I suppose, is what we're listening to. Yeah, that's right. Is that your own time? No, this is um, a compilation CD that went with the book that uh, Virgin released, and it's um, two CDs of music mentioned in the book. Um, I do have one track on it, which is a duet with John Zorn, but it's it's a mixture of music which ranges from King Tubby to Debussy. So it's across all genres. I mean, in, in one sense, it's, it, it's a CD which you could listen to if you bought the book and you're finding it difficult to get some of these examples. And on the one, on the other hand, it's it's a CD which I very much enjoyed doing because it, I think, it goes against that trend of so many CD compilations to create a tiny market-oriented, you know, narrow genres of music. It just ignores all that and jumps from one thing to the other. And I mean, it's a question of making it work. You know, how do you how do you go from one piece of music to another when the, the connections are really, they come from a feeling about sound or a theory in the book, but uh, it's a very instinctive kind of CD. So you could listen to it separately from the book, I mean. Indian influence. Indian influence. Um, yeah, you write about Indian influence. There's, uh, 
there's a lot of Indonesian influence. And that's partly because, as I said before, um, to me this moment when Debussy heard Javanese music in Paris was, um, I think, a very significant moment in 20th century music. So I included a couple of Indonesian examples, one using a relatively traditional ensemble and one using a mixture of traditional instruments and um, contemporary recording techniques and electronics. So, you know, one of these strange environments. Anybody else? Yes, my name is David. Hi. Um, you're telling about an environment and soundscapes like that. Yeah. Um, how about uh, if, if you see the music in, in, in a dimension, um, is there uh, also uh, an effect dimension? Uh, for example, uh, uh, you see now on the dance floors with the VJ. Um, can you tell a little bit about um, to see this? this um, you mean a visual equivalent? Yes. Of what I'm talking if, about. Yes. If you see the music as a dimension, can you see this visual aspect also as a dimension? Yes, I do. Um, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, David Cunningham, who's a uh, composer. And he criticized the book for ignoring the obvious visual references that could have been put in throughout um, parallels with painting and film and performance work and uh, video, so on and so on. And I kind of accept that criticism, but for me it was a question of making the book manageable. You know, I, it, otherwise you have something that's twice as big and only appeals to an academic audience. So, you know, I wanted to do a book that people could actually read and, and enjoy and they wouldn't have to be art specialists. But at the same time, I think that in a way you could write another book, somebody could, maybe even I could, which would deal with this parallel, maybe it's not parallel, it's, it's so closely entwined, um, where sound has a visual dimension. And, um, that becomes more and more important, or at least we're told it becomes more and more important. I'm beginning to wonder about that at the moment, uh, because for the last, well, more than five years, everybody, uh, including myself, has been talking about this move towards um, the synergy of um, visuals and sound text, whether it's in developments that have come after MTV or interactive software of various clients, CD-ROMs, and so on and so on and so on. I really need to wonder, because I, I see a lot of it just not really happening, but uh, at the same time, there is a very interesting link there. The other thing is I really wanted to concentrate on sound because I'm so tired of music criticism which talks about words or talks about um, sociology or talks about um, people's drug habits or love affairs. It talks about anything rather than talks about sound. So I wanted to write a book which was mainly, not exclusively, but mainly about sound or try to because it's a very difficult thing to do, I think. Um, so that was another reason really for ignoring some of the rather obvious links with uh, the visual dimension. But I, I do think it's important, yeah. And don't you think that it is um, interfering or maybe distorting uh, the, uh, your, your uh, visual 
when when, there, when you hear the music, you you have a, an, an, um, a visual experience. But if you create also a visual experience, don't you think it is uh, impossible to let it be the same experience? Well, I don't like it myself. Exactly, that's what I mean. Well, I say I don't like it. That's not totally true. Um, in some cases, I do like it. Like, for, for instance, I wrote a book about hip-hop in 1984. And since then, well, in recent years, I've kind of lost, <coughs> lost enthusiasm a little bit from, for a lot of hip-hop. But sometimes late at night, I might switch on the television and switch on a cable channel that's showing a whole lot of hip-hop videos. And for some reason, the records come to life for me. Um, whereas when I just hear them, they don't so much. And I wonder why that is. I wonder whether there's, there are certain forms of music where the narrative and the atmosphere is conceived very visually. So it's almost as if it needs visual representation to make itself whole. Yes. But in other forms of music, where, for example, the music is conceived, conceived totally in terms of sound or a rather ambiguous song, and then a video is made, or if it's what you might call abstract music, and then abstract, you know, so computer-generated images are added to it, then for me, it has no interest at all, and it just tends to destroy whatever it was I felt about the music in the first place. I mean, I think that's been a really destructive thing, and I, I certainly feel with a lot of the attempts at um, computer-generated images going with techno and so on, that they take away from the music rather than add to it, because they always, they always contribute the most banal interpretation of what the music may be about. The, the, the simple, the first, the first interpretation you might come from, whereas you might have a completely different image of it. You know, your image in listening to a piece of electronic music, for example, is that you might be listening to, uh, I don't know, crickets in Central Park, New York, and then somebody has a, you know, video of a spaceship going through a tunnel, and <laughs> your, your image is kind of uh, stepped on. Yes. Thank you. Um, I would like to elaborate on the techno music, music that you talked about. Um, this is a subculture that uses the most technology in creating this music, uh, but it uses it only um, for changing the, the material. The form of the music is very simple. Sometimes there even, I mean, there's no vocals, a lot of it. Uh, how can there be such a contrast between the use of technology? Well, there often is a contrast between the use of technology. I mean, you only have to look at Hollywood films to mm -hmm. see that. Um, you know, state-of-the-art technology um, is being used to create regressive narratives. So I don't think that's unusual. Um, at the same time, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily criticize that. I don't think that complicated technology has to create complicated art. And I think it's often a fault, or a, um, it's often a it's often a temptation, put it that way, for somebody using technology, new complex technology, to be seduced by the complicated possibilities of it, rather than concentrating on what they're doing, um, and. Um, Really, there's nothing worse than listening to the workings of technology rather than the workings of a human being. So, in some respects, I agree with what I think you're saying. 
that um, I mean certainly now the form of the music seems um, pretty simplistic in terms of the fact that the music has had um, over ten years to develop and certain examples are no different to the ones that happened right at the beginning yet the technology has transformed completely and if you think about the people at the beginning they were working with the absolute minimum equipment and uh, now people are working with a huge array of, of equipment yet producing very similar results so um, it's obviously a, qu a question of, of why has the form stayed the same? Well, to me, the reason the form has stayed the same is, is because it's, it's still linked in with dance clubs in that particular world. Now, I, th I think that has some advantages and some disadvantages. It means that the music doesn't disappear into uh, some kind of art ghetto. But at the same time, it, it it's controlled by, you know, the needs of, of dance clubs and the whims of DJs. And DJs aren't always the best people to make decisions about music. I think. Uh, but it's a very practical form of music. It's it, it's a functional form of music. You know, the roots of techno um, are in disco. I don't care what anybody else says. The roots of techno are in disco, and uh, I mean I love disco. That's not a criticism, but you know disco was a very functional music, and uh, so that I think is the reason why so much of it follows a certain form, you know, because it comes from that functionalism. I mean the other thing is. That um, a lot of this technology, which is supposedly so complicated, is conceptually very simplistic. You know, it, it determines a certain way of working, which is just down to um, programming the software and so on. So, um, you know, it doesn't much matter how much of it you've got. If that's what you use, and that's what you use exclusively, then it will tend to force the majority of people, all but the most inventive musicians, into fairly um, conservative structures. Um, it's, it's very hard, there's a lot of sequencing software to do, to, to move outside of it. Certainly, it's virtually impossible to do it spontaneously. So what you do is so premeditated and I think in the end it's easier just to follow what the software dictates, which is, is obviously not a good thing for music. I mean for myself I, I, I actually really enjoy working in studios now because you have such a range of opportunities and, and it seems easier to mix mix them, you know, like the most basic levels of technology with the most sophisticated levels of technology, bring them together. Um, but I do think, from my own point of view, I think you have to mix them. And I think if you just use um, the technology of the past 10 years, or sh should I say post-computer post technology, then um, and also you're, you're aiming at dance clubs, then it's fairly inevitable that you're going to make a certain kind of music. And it, it may be great, you know, but it, the form of it will probably be fairly conservative by now. I, I don't want to give a, a promo on behalf of Stein, but it, I mean, there are other solutions now. You don't have to use sequencing. Yeah, you want to yeah. use MIDI. Yeah. And a lot of work's been done in this place um, whereby you can have direct interface 
from some physical action. It can be playing a regular instrument or it can be hitting a cricket bat or throwing a ball or whatever. Yeah. And you can work with this stuff in a much more physical way. Yeah, well, I think... Um, I don't think there are many people that are working in the techno field that are working that way. No, but maybe they, they don't but, know that it exists. Yeah, but highly probably, and, and I think that... <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> I think um, that physicality of movement uh, may make a big difference. It's just to get away from the mouse, you know. <laughs> but, um, I mean, you were talking about techno specifically. I yeah. mean, I'm aware of all those other things, but mostly they make a different kind of music. And I think it would be interesting when all those things come together. Because personally, I don't, I don't have a lot of interest in a lot of the music being made by cricket bats and so on at the moment. But <laughs> um, I like the idea of you know, this point in the future where that the most unlikely musicians are using this technology. It's a little bit like the question about dub, you know, where suddenly all these um, basic electronic music techniques were used in the context of popular music to radically restructure it. So something weird and wonderful began to happen. And that kind of thing is very exciting, I think. Uh, I don't see why people involved in techno shouldn't use all those things. I think, it, in a way, it's, it's a way out of their problems. Because the problem with techno is as I say, it's, it's a descendant of disco, and it was disco that invented the track date, and the track date being the, the disco diva turning up at the discotheque and singing along to a backing track. And to me, a lot of techno performances still work that way. You know, a lot of people try and subvert it in different ways or work more, more spontaneously, but the basis of it very often is, is the same and, and it has no life to it. It's just got no really much of small pain to see you do that. So, you know, different performance tools could, could be a way out of that particular MIDI based um, track. I think you're right about MIDI, yeah. It's, it, it is the problem with who uses it. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's no more a trap than a violin is. Um, but, you know, just in a way that an orchestra will lead to one kind of banality, so MIDI will lead to another kind of banality, and that's really what I'm talking about. 
I think the interesting thing about people like Tricky is that um, there's a feel about the music that, although it is very much studio music, and I, I'm very pro studio music. You know, I'm, I tend to think most of the interesting things going on these days happen in the studio. Um, and in a sense, I think they have, that's true for a long time. You know, that's, this music from the street thing. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and we were both agreeing on the fact that some of this so-called music in the street found its most <coughs> perfect expression in the recording studio, like Sly Stone, for example. You know, I, I mean, the, to me, the greatest things he ever did were you know, the, the recordings he made on There's a Riot going on, which were just absolutely studio productions. Um, couldn't be anything else, couldn't be done wrong. There's a strong parallel there with Tricky, I think, in terms of <coughs> the atmosphere of those recordings and what was being created. But there is a, a, an attitude of mind in those recordings which is perhaps looser. You know, I, I mean, I think the thing about MIDI is that it's a trap in the sense that it can lock people into its own demands. And, and the interesting people, you know, are those who use it just as, as an expediency, just as a convenient tool, but really it's, it's, they're not even conscious of it. You know, it's, it's just something that's working for them in the deep background. I think it had a, a lot of sources. Um, but I think disco, in the sense of a place um, where records were mixed as much as um, a tradition coming from R&B, hence coming from blues and jazz, hence coming from Africa. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are relationships, you know, if you, if you listen to, uh, say, Derek May's early work, um, you can hear that it comes from a very different sensibility to I don't know, Depeche Mode. You know, it's, it has a link there. Yeah, which I couldn't make a link between Derek May and any of those disco guys. You couldn't? I couldn't. Well, it's interesting you say that because. Um, Not about functional. The, the functional <coughs> is both and dancing. They're both dancing. You can or can't? Can. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you're saying you can't see a link between, you can't see a link between Derek May and Disco, or you can? I, I can see a link, but I see, I see more links. I, in fact, I see more links with African music. But right. maybe it is in Disco, but I don't see it. Do you don't see a link between disco and other music? Aha. Uh -huh. um, well, it depends what disco you're listening to. <laughs> you know, some of the very first disco records, before disco was called disco, were in fact African records made in Europe. Um, and there are a number of uh, African musicians like uh, Ola Kunji, for example, who made disco records um, with African influences. And, and I think that, that concept of a very percussion-based music, which
which drew from Latin music as well. So, you know, African again, whether it was Brazilian or Cuban or Puerto Rican. Um, a fundamental part of uh, disco. But I'm talking about disco, not the Bee Gees. Right? I'm talking about disco as very much part of that R&B tradition. So I think if you listen to those kind of records, then yeah, you can, you can hear quite a lot of Africa in there. But then, you know, rhythmically speaking, neither disco nor techno are anywhere near as rhythmically complex and sophisticated as a lot of West African and Central African music. You know? But then you think of somebody like Fela Kuti, you know, being influenced by James Brown. And what Fela Kuti was doing in the 70s was in a way, you know, pure trance music. Disco trance music. Um, and I think you can relate that to techno very easily. It depends which part of Africa you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what goes on in Senegal and what goes on in Zaire is very different to what goes on in Zimbabwe, Morocco. Um, I think there's, there's strong links for me. Yeah. Anybody else? Or is, that a... is it possible to create a soundscape uh, from a uh, like a cricket in another way? Is it possible to create a soundscape from a cricket? Yes, to create another way. Also, for example, with another sound, but the same uh, soundscape. You mean synthesize a cricket? <laughs> for example. Um, well, that's, <coughs> that's what Japanese technologists are trying to achieve. <laughs> failing miserably, I think, but uh, I guess it's possible to come close these days, yeah. But, um, I always think, well, why would you want to? Well, I don't mean to uh, make the same sound, yeah. but with uh, uh, another sound, the same Soundscape, an imaginary soundscape. Oh, yeah, yeah, why not? I mean, yeah, all kinds of people are doing that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, one last question on sound on the synthetic vegetables without any way. The future of technology will probably be less.
kind of dramatic reconstruction of space. But I think, you know, in, in what he was doing when he was recording with orchestras in separate studios and working in stereo, but having actually separated ensembles of musicians in different studios. Um, so creating an incredibly exaggerated stereo sound field, he was able to make amazing illusions. You know, if you, if you sit in the right spot and listen to an Esquivel recording, you can sort of hear grand pianos floating between your loudspeakers. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and I think the potential for that kind of thing is, is vast for it. As you say, I think it will have a huge effect on the kind of spaces we're accustomed to. You know, I think one of the frustrations for music now is, in the end, it's often not really the technology, although the technology can provide its limitations. It's just that you're working in the same kind of spaces which have been around for so long. It's, it just doesn't really work. I, I don't, I can't really give you any names of, of people who are working in that particular field, but I can see that kind of thing um, will be something that is concentrated on in the future. Yeah. Thanks. I guess uh, people who like to talk more can also be. Okay, thank you very much.